She was supposed to be back home at around 5 p.m., but when dinner time rolled around, Ji Jiao had not come home. At first, her parents weren't too concerned. You know, they figured that maybe she had just lost track of time, so they continued to wait. But when 6 p.m. rolled around, they started to get really worried. Her parents actually left the house and they started looking for her. For a few hours, both parents walked the streets looking for any signs of their daughter. You know, they searched and searched, but they couldn't find Ji Jiao anywhere. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So welcome to episode 26. Today we're gonna be talking about what happened to 12 year old Ji Zhao Li. I have never heard about this case before and it honestly scared me. I don't know, but just like thinking about what could have possibly happened to her is really eerie and my heart just breaks for the family. Cases where people just vanish are always so upsetting. I don't understand how this happens. There's also very little coverage on Ji Zhao's case. Granted, it did happen many years ago, but this is an unsolved case, so the family is still looking for closure. There is so much information to go over, so let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Ji Zhao Li. Ji Zhao Li was born on April 10th, 1975 in Canton, China to her mother Yan Li and father Di Cheng. Now, Ji Zhao was the second daughter to her parents. She had a sister who was two years older than her, and both daughters were born back when China had a one-child-per-family policy. For those that don't know, the one-child policy was a population planning initiative in China that happened between 1979 and 2015 to curb the country's rapid population growth by restricting many families to having just one single child. So, the family had to keep Ji Zhao hidden until they could leave the country or until this law would no longer exist. Due to this, Ji Zhao's upbringing was hard because she couldn't go out in public and her family had very little money and resources. China did send rations of food to people, but they couldn't ask for more since they weren't supposed to have two children. Despite this, Yan said that Ji Zhao was always thinking of others. There was a time where Yan didn't have any food to eat for herself and Ji Zhao actually gave her an egg that she had saved so that her mother wouldn't be hungry. That antidote just like made me tear up. You know, that just shows how sweet Ji Zhao truly was and how much she just loved her mother. Yan's dream was to move to America to begin a new life and in 1985, her dream came true. The family's visas were approved and they were able to move to Honolulu, Hawaii. They were all very excited to leave China and start this new chapter of their lives. They moved into a garage that had been converted into an apartment. Now, the family was not making good money at this point. Di Chang was earning about $800 a month while working as a kitchen helper at a local Chinese restaurant and the rent for their apartment was $250 a month, so money was very tight. Their living room was furnished with carpet cast off, they had two faded sofas in the living room, and they had a small dining table in the corner. The kitchen was really small, there really wasn't space to cook, and there actually was no hot water in this garage, so they had to boil water. Now, they did have two bedrooms, but these bedrooms were extremely tiny. Ji Zhao had to share a double bed with her older sister in one room, and then in the other room, her parents would sleep. Now, at this point, Yan and Di Chang had given birth to a third daughter, so now they were a family of five, and this little girl would have to sleep in the same bed as her parents because there just wasn't enough room for everyone. Despite the cramped quarters, the family was happy. You know, they were just grateful for the fact that they were finally out of China and that they were one step closer to achieving their dreams, which was to become a U.S. citizen. They also really liked living in Hawaii. They felt like it was a really safe place for the children to grow up. They really weren't that many murder cases or kidnapping cases at the time. There was also a sense of community and things just seemed very relaxed there. I think that's why this case was so popular back then because everyone thought that Hawaii was pretty safe. So when Ji Zhao's case came out, the community was shocked. Going back to Ji Zhao, she started school at Royal Elementary School and was learning to speak English. According to her teachers, her English wasn't the best, but you know, people were still able to understand her and she was also able to fully understand English. 
Everyone describes Ji Zhao as being very helpful, kind, and, you know, she would always go out of her way to help others. She would bring candy to school all the time to share with other classmates, and her teachers say that she was sensitive, but she wouldn't let others push her around. Now, her family describes her as being very well-behaved, obedient, and just an overall great child. She loved her family so much, and her family just absolutely adored her. They all had such a beautiful and close, loving relationship. So, Ji Zhao's school was having a fundraiser selling raffle tickets for Zippy's Chili, which was a diner in the area known for their chili. Each raffle ticket was $2.25, and if you sold $150 worth of tickets, you would win a field trip to the Big Island in Hawaii. So, of course, all of the students were very excited about this prize, and many of them were selling the tickets door to door. They were told by their family and by the school to only sell to family members, to neighbors, to friends, and to not sell to strangers. I feel like this was like such a common thing back in the day. I remember we also had to sell chocolate to people and we would just like go around the neighborhood knocking on people's doors. And now that I think about it, that's really alarming. It's one thing if you're knocking on a family member's door, but to just knock on a complete stranger's house all by yourself at such a young age is truly frightening. At the same time, this happened in the 80s, and again, people felt very safe in Hawaii, so I feel like the school and the families just weren't really too concerned about kids going and selling door to door. According to the teachers, Ji Zhao wasn't very interested in going on the field trip at first, but when she learned that one of her best friends, Hwan Jun Lu, was going to go on the trip, that's when she decided that she also wanted to go, and she started selling these tickets. In her first three days, Ji Zhao already sold $40 worth of tickets. But at this point, Ji Zhao had already sold tickets to everyone she knew. So, you know, she knew that if she wanted to reach the $150 goal, she would have to branch out and start selling to people that she didn't know. On Thursday, February 11th, 1988, 12-year-old Ji Zhao woke up had breakfast and got ready for school. She went to school that day and it seemed just like a normal day. At around 2.15, school was let out and Ji Zhao returned home. Ji Zhao told her mother that she wanted to go sell tickets that afternoon and her mom didn't want her to go because she didn't want her to go out by herself. You know, her mom was very overprotective and even though the community did feel safe and trusting, she still didn't want her daughter to go out there all by herself to sell these tickets. But Ji Zhao kept begging to go. You know, she kept saying, quote, just let me go for one hour. This is my last day to sell tickets. I have to sell tickets. Tomorrow, I'll turn in the tickets that I can't sell. I won't go far. I'll only be gone for one hour. This is my last chance to sell the tickets. And this was enough to convince Yan to let Ji Zhao go by herself but on several conditions. She couldn't go in anyone's car or inside someone's house. She had to avoid speaking to anyone who seemed strange or made her feel uncomfortable, and she had to be back by 5 p.m. in time for dinner. Ji Zhao agreed to this plan, and her mother gave her a wristwatch so that she would be able to know the time while she was out. Ji Zhao also said that she was going to time herself while she was selling the tickets, and then she left the house at around 3.30 p.m. She walked to a neighbor's house just down the street where one of her friends lived. She knocked on the door and asked her friend if she wanted to come with her to sell some tickets, but her friend wasn't able to go, so Ji Zhao continued walking on her own. I also feel like back then, it was more normal for like 12-year-olds to do things by themselves. I mean, I remember growing up, I was like 9 or 10 years old, and I would literally, you know, go to the grocery store by myself or just bike by myself. So I feel like it's not uncommon for 12-year-olds and like young teens to be walking walking around by themselves at this time. So after walking around, Ji Zhao decided to sell to customers coming and going from two 7-Eleven convenience stores near Nua Anu Avenue and Kuakini Street, which were only a three minute walk from each other and also close to Ji Zhao's home. Now at the 7-Eleven, she was specifically going up to people getting out or into their cars. Many customers at the 7-Eleven came forward and said that they did see her that day selling these tickets and that they even interacted 
connected with her. She was supposed to be back home at around 5 p.m., but when dinner time rolled around, Ji Jiao had not come home. At first, her parents weren't too concerned. You know, they figured that maybe she had just lost track of time, so they continued to wait. But when 6 p.m. rolled around, they started to get really worried. Her parents actually left the house and they started looking for her. For a few hours, both parents walked the streets looking for any signs of their daughter. You know, they searched and searched, but they couldn't find Ji Jiao anywhere. Now, let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors at Caraway, who make this podcast possible. Life is full of firsts, whether you're starting college, getting into the job market, or moving into your own place. Doing things for the first time can be overwhelming. If it's your first time managing your healthcare by yourself, let Caraway make it easier for you. Caraway has the care you need all in one place. Their easy-to-use app offers physical, mental, and reproductive healthcare tailored to the needs of Gen Z. With Caraway, you you have unlimited 24-7 access to an experienced care team of doctors, therapists, psychiatrists, gynecologists, nurses, and health advisors. And you'll always talk to a real person, not a robot. Careway can help manage different healthcare concerns like getting medicine when you're sick, treating depression, or refilling birth control prescriptions. You can also message your care team to get quick answers to your questions, big or small, like why your headache won't go away or you need to know if a mole looks normal. There are no long wait times, inconvenient hours, surprise fees, or Googling your symptoms. With Careway, your healthcare is integrated in one place, accessible wherever you need help. Memberships start at less than $25 a month when you select an annual membership. That's less than copay at Urgent Care. All the care you receive from Caraway is covered by your membership fee, including therapy sessions. And if you need labs, in-person care, or prescriptions, your team can coordinate with your doctors outside of Caraway and even help you navigate insurance questions. Right now, Caraway is offering new members 30 days completely free if you go to Caraway dot health slash what happened there's no credit card required to try it get free and unlimited access to chat with their care team for 30 days that's c-a-r-a-w-a-y dot health slash what happened for 30 days completely free caraway is available in select states go to caraway dot health slash what happened to learn more At 8.45 p.m., Ji Jiao's parents called the police to report her as missing. The family knew that she wouldn't have run away from home. You know, she absolutely loved her family and she didn't even have a history of running away. So something bad must have happened. Detectives from the missing persons unit, the juvenile division, and the patrol unit all took action right away and they went out looking for her. The first night search was unsuccessful. There was literally no signs of Ji Jiao anywhere. Police used search dogs to try and pick up her scent, but they weren't able to. Police also put out a media report and they put out photos of Ji Jiao, but they weren't able to have the media report on what she was last seen wearing because of translation issues. I mean, at this point, her parents didn't really know English that well, so they were having trouble communicating with the police and with the public about their daughter's disappearance. Missing flyers were also put up all over town. On the flyer, it said that Ji Jiao was four foot 11, she weighed 70 pounds, had brown eyes, black hair, and a fair complexion. So in the following days, some witnesses did come forward saying that they saw her selling tickets the day she went missing. Two people that saw her were actually her neighbors. One neighbor said that they saw Ji Jiao selling tickets at 3.30 p.m. Another said that they spoke to her, but that they didn't buy a ticket because they had already bought one earlier that week. A clerk from 7-Eleven also came forward and said that at 4 p.m., quote, she was here by herself. She picked up a nacho and tried to give me a chili ticket. I don't know if she was trying to pay for the nacho with a ticket, but I told her I couldn't take it, and then she left, end quote. The clerk knew for sure that it was Ji Jiao because he would actually see her and her older sister there all the time after school. People had also called in claiming that they had seen Ji Jiao since the day of her disappearance, so police followed up on all of these leads, but they led to nowhere. On February 15th, some new witnesses came forward saying that they had seen her at 7-Eleven in the parking lot at times ranging between 4 and 4.45 p.m. These witness statements were able to help police put together a timeline of when Ji Jiao was last seen. 
At this time, there were also two rewards made for any information leading to her return. The first part was funded from Zippy's Diner, who created the fundraiser that Ji Zhao was selling tickets for. And the other part was from Southland Corporation, which is the company that operates the two 7-Elevens. So combined, it was a $2,500 reward. Then the second reward was for $20,000, and that came from the Chinese Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii and the United States Chinese Society. On Thursday, February 18th, 18th, the police set up a series of roadblocks near the 7-Elevens and on Jijiao Street. At the roadblocks, around 40 different officers stopped drivers and showed them photos of her. At this point, they finally knew what Ji Zhao was last seen wearing, which was white shorts with three hearts on them, a yellow t-shirt with a flower on it, and blue slippers, which are what the locals call flip-flops. Police also got onto city buses in the same area, and they spoke to drivers and passengers to see if, you know, maybe they knew anything about this case, but no one did. Then they headed back to the 7-Eleven to speak to people there because they knew that someone must have seen her, you know, maybe saw her walking away with someone or maybe saw her getting into someone's car. But there really wasn't that much helpful information at the 7-Eleven. And I always feel like witness accounts are so hard to come by because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm out and about, I really don't notice people that much. Like, for example, if I go to Starbucks and someone asks me, you know, did you see this person here? I probably wouldn't have realized it. You know, I am aware of my surroundings, but I just don't have a good recollection of people. So I think that might be the scenario with a lot of other people. You know, just because they were at the 7-Eleven at the same time as Ji Zhao doesn't mean that they were fully aware that she was there or were watching her or looking at what she was doing or who she was speaking to. Anyways, going back to the investigation, police were going door to door Door asking if anybody in the neighborhood or in the area had seen her. One witness did say that they saw her at around 5 p.m. on her street near her home, and they also added that they saw her speaking to a man. There's actually more than one person that saw her speaking to a man that day. A couple of witnesses also verified a similar story and said that they saw her speaking to a man for about 5 to 10 minutes, and investigators were able to get these witnesses to do a composite sketch of this man. On February 20th, police released a sketch to the public along with a statement from Lieutenant Gary Diaz. They stated that Ji Zhao had been seen speaking with a man outside of 7-Eleven between 4.30 and 4.45 p.m. Another witness had also seen this man in the area earlier in the day. He was described as white, six feet tall, and slender with a long forehead with long, dirty blonde hair that was brushed back from his face. He was wearing a blue, green plaid shirt and tan pants and his overall appearance was neat. The lieutenant said that they wanted to speak to this man, but he didn't say that this man for sure kidnapped Ji Zhao. Diaz said, quote, we aren't accusing him of anything. We're not calling him a suspect. We just want to talk to him. We're not saying he's the last person who saw her. In fact, we have sightings of her from 3.30 p.m. to 5.15 p.m. So after this information and the composite sketch was released, police received around 50 tips from people who thought that they knew the man and from people who thought that they had seen him. So some tips said that this man often hangs out in the Waikiki area at the beach. So police were following up on all these leads and they also continued to canvass the neighborhood. The Hawaii State Emergency Unit, which was a nonprofit search and rescue organization, also joined the search and they had volunteers searching the areas. During this time, Ji Zhao's father would also regularly go out and look for his daughter on his own, often just sticking to their neighborhood and the 7-Elevens. At this time, he was still working his job at the Chinese restaurant and Yan had actually started a job at a factory just a few days before Ji Zhao disappeared, but now she actually had to take time off, which of course didn't help the family with the financial situation they were in. People did offer to give them money to help them get through this difficult time, but they rejected any type of payment. They had a lot of pride and they wanted to be hard workers and, you know, earn this money themselves. So as you can imagine, this was just such a hard time for the family. They were dealing with the disappearance of their daughter and they were also dealing with money issues. Now, during this time, something weird did happen happened to Ji Zhao's mother. On April 24th, 1988, Yan was walking near Foster Botanic Gardens at around 5.20 in the morning when she says that a guy driving stopped his car next to her, leaned over, opened his passenger door, 
and said something to her. Now, Jan didn't understand English that well, so she just turned around and she ran away because she thought that this guy was trying to abduct her. She told police about this incident and they were trying to figure out if this was related to Ji Zhao's disappearance. Maybe that guy told her something that had to do with her case, but Jan just didn't understand it. Now, she described this man as a Caucasian man with a mustache driving an older white car. Detectives said that at the time, they didn't have enough information to call this an attempted kidnapping since there was no physical contact between this man and Jan. Now, this was a fear that Jan had from the start of the investigation. A few days after Ji Zhao had disappeared, she actually asked the media to not identify her family because she was scared that whoever had taken her daughter would return to harm the rest of the family. Now, this was from a newspaper article that I read that was published in 1988. I was not able to find an update on this. I don't know if detectives were able to find this guy and confirm that he wasn't trying to abduct Jan or if they discovered what he had told her. I really wish that there was more about this. I just feel like this is an example of how stressed and paranoid the family was during this time. I mean, maybe this guy was just stopping Yan to tell her something that had nothing to do with Ji Zhao's case. You know, maybe he wasn't trying to abduct her, but that's how scared Yan was about anybody that approached her. Now, going back to the investigation on February 22nd, Lieutenant Diaz informed the public that there were sightings of Ji Zhao on February 14th three days after her disappearance. These witnesses said that they saw a girl who resembled Ji Zhao at around 3.30 p.m. sitting in the backseat of a car at the Sunset Beach service station while the driver filled the gas tank. And the gas station is about 40 miles north of Honolulu, where Ji Zhao lives. Lieutenant Diaz said that the car was a 1954 to 1957 yellow Chevy with multiple primer spots on the hood, driver's door, and rear panel. The car also had chrome rims and a swan hood ornament, and the car was square-backed. Lieutenant Diaz also released information saying that the driver was a dark-skinned man in his 30s. His hair had been dyed orange or was like orangey blonde, and he also wore it in a ponytail. He said that police would be running computer checks for the car and that they would also be looking into similar cars and would be speaking to the owners. Lieutenant Diaz and 15 other investigators had already canvassed the area of the gas station, asking people if they had seen the car or if they knew the driver but they didn't get any leads from this. Diaz also said that they still get around 10 to 15 tips a day that they look into. So after this information was released, investigators received about 60 tips about this vehicle. So Lieutenant Diaz was focusing on those tips rather than the computer records because that was more time consuming and just not as efficient. An officer had to be assigned to a large number of the cars then they had to track down and interview each individual owner, so it was a lot of work. This was also 1988, so you know, technology wasn't as good back then and the records weren't as detailed. So detectives were going to follow the 60 tips first and then use a computer if those tips got them nowhere. There were about 425 vehicles that matched the description of the yellow car registered with the DMV on the island, but they also believed that maybe there was an additional 200 vehicles on the island that weren't registered. So that's a lot of possible suspects. But Lieutenant Diaz said that the vehicle wasn't their only lead and that they were still looking for information about the first man from the composite sketch. Now, a tip also came in that Ji Zhao had been kidnapped by someone from China, but that tip didn't lead anywhere. In early March, a man called 911 at 10 p.m. and told the operator that a friend of his had admitted to him that he had killed Ji Zhao. Then this man said, he's coming back, call me tomorrow, and he just hung up the phone. The operator said that this man sounded genuinely scared. Now, investigators weren't going to wait till the next day to call him back to, you know, verify what he was saying. I'm not sure if this man gave them his address and, you know, his phone number or if 911 just had that information. But Lieutenant Diaz and a couple of other officers actually went to the man's house and questioned him about this phone call. In the end, police discovered that this man 
man just made it up as some type of drunken prank call. And apparently, that wasn't the only prank call that investigators had gotten in the case. Diaz said that they had gotten numerous prank calls and that wasn't even the worst one, which is insane to me. Like, people are so sick in their head and just so bored in life that they feel like they have nothing better to do than to take time away from an investigation and joke about something so serious. In March, investigators had already looked into 325 of the 425 cars matching the description that were on the DMV list. But investigators did also note that Jijiao was seen at the 7-Eleven multiple times the day she disappeared, but no one saw that yellow car in the area. Also, I just want to add that she was seen on her own street at 5 p.m. And then I'm not sure who saw her and where at 5.15 p.m. So I don't know if investigators still think that she was there or it was someone else or what because investigators didn't mention any of her neighbors seeing the car either. So as the weeks went on, less officers were on the case, but volunteer search parties were organized by retired military policeman Frank Lee and Honolulu attorney Wilson. Lu. The whole island of Oahu was divided into 21 designated areas for different search parties. Wilson and Frank were absolutely amazing in supporting the family and organizing these search parties and, you know, just getting the word out there about Ji Zhao's disappearance. They both wanted to help the family because they knew that there was a language barrier and that they had recently moved to Hawaii. So they weren't fully adjusted to the culture and to the environment yet. So, you know, they just wanted to help them speak to the police and just kind of act as a liaison between between them. So the search parties went on for the next few months and thousands of people volunteered. But ultimately, these searches didn't find Ji Zhao or any signs of her or potential evidence. Towards the end of April, Wilson, who is one of the organizers of the search parties, stated that they had found a new witness. This witness said that they had seen Ji Zhao the day that she disappeared being dragged through the 7-Eleven by her arm by a boy around her age. The witnesses also said that this boy told people that Ji Zhao was his sister. But as we know, Ji Zhao does not have any brothers. Lieutenant Diaz said that they had already heard about this tip and that they couldn't find anything to back it up because this sighting happened at 10 a.m. and it was confirmed that at this time, Ji Zhao was at school. Wilson also added that they were looking for an older Asian man who was seen talking to Ji Zhao at 5 p.m. But Lieutenant Diaz said that they didn't have any witnesses giving them this information and that police didn't have any information about this, like where the conversation took place, what it was about, or who this man was or if it was actually Ji Zhao. So I think this is a different tip from the neighbor who witnessed Ji Zhao on her street because I feel like a neighbor would know for sure what she looked like. But maybe they also determined that the tip was actually incorrect. I'm not really sure. After this, the investigation and the searches continue to slow down. In November, investigators said that they hadn't had any recent leads and they were never able to find the two men that they wanted to question. They also weren't able to find the yellow Chevy. The head of the search party, Frank Lee, said that he had gotten multiple tips that Ji Zhao was abducted by someone from a sex trafficking ring but nothing really came from these tips that the public knows of. By the end of 1988, police believed that Ji Zhao had most likely been the victim of a homicide. In August of 1994, Frank Lee was still searching for her because, you know, despite his age and his health, he was determined to find her. Frank Lee and Wilson Liu were working with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children who were developing a new age progress photo of what Ji Zhao would look like now. In 1995, they completed the age progression photo, so they teamed up with the Advo Incorporated, which is a mail-based company in Connecticut. So this was a company that mailed ads, but they also included images of missing people. On April 10th, 1995, Ji Zhao's 20th birthday, the flyer with her old photo and the age progress photo was sent out to over 57 million homes in the US. After this, they started receiving a ton of new leads. The calls that seemed to be more legitimate were sent to the Honolulu police so that they could follow up. Investigators said that they got 30 solid leads that they believed might help in this case. But then again, these leads didn't get investigators anywhere and Ji Zhao's case went cold. In the early 2000s, Lieutenant Diaz wrote a book about his experience as a Honolulu lieutenant called Honolulu Cop. 
He mentioned several cases in the book, including Ji Zhao's. He wrote about a lead that had always stuck out to him. He wrote that a cop had brought to his attention a man who had been accused of harassing young women as they walked down the streets on multiple occasions. So this man would talk about himself in the third person and he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia. Lieutenant Diaz had questioned this man about Ji Zhao and this man said, quote, he took her up to Nua Anu stream. Lieutenant Diaz then did a search of the stream and he actually brought in a SWAT team, search dogs, and cadaver dogs. They searched the entire stream, but there was no signs of Ji Zhao. Now, detectives questioned this man again multiple times and he would give them conflicting information. Like he knew where she was and he knew where she was being kept, you know, kind of implying sometimes that she was dead and then other times he would imply that she was still alive. As an interrogation tactic, Diaz told the man that they didn't need his help anymore and that they wouldn't talk to him anymore. You know, they were kind of hoping that he would want to keep the investigator's attention, so they thought that he would give up another detail. But instead, this man showed up to Lieutenant Diaz's home and he actually threatened him with a gun. He was arrested for this and sentenced to a mental health facility. And that was it. Lieutenant Diaz never got any more details from this man, including if he was just lying about everything in the first place. In the time since her disappearance, her family moved, you know, because living in a garage wasn't really sustainable forever. But the family has always kept the same landline in case Ji Zhao ever called. Although she's presumed dead, her mother is still holding on to hope because they don't know for sure what happened to her. In 2014, she said that Elizabeth Smart case, which I've covered on this podcast before, gave her hope that Ji Zhao could someday return home. But she also didn't want to be giving herself false hope, so it's just really hard. There was also an updated age progress photo of Ji Zhao at age 37. Now, the reality of seeing her age progress photo makes both of her parents cry so much because they just wish that they could see their daughter like that in real life. In an effort to bring more attention and awareness to unsolved cases, the Missing Child Center of Hawaii has a tab on their website that links directly to a list of missing and endangered children. The site is regularly updated and people are happy about this change because they are hopeful that it'll bring more attention and awareness to these cases. Ji Zhao is on this website and as I was going through the website, just to get more information. I came across the list of all the missing children and it just broke my heart. I mean, what is happening? Why are there so many missing children and where are they? It's really sad. I mean, there were children from the age of 13 to 17 to just nine years old on this list and it just breaks my heart. So let's go over some questions and theories because this case is just so confusing to me because how was she taken in broad daylight but no one saw anything? No one heard her scream or, you know, anything out of the ordinary. I'm very confused by the people who said that they saw Ji Zhao on her street at 5 p.m. and we don't know where the 515 sighting actually happened. Like, was it also on her street? Was it at the 7-Eleven? I mean, most reports say that she was last seen at 7-Eleven at 4.45 p.m. So I'm not sure if those two other sightings were just determined to not be credible or what happened with those. How were police also not able to find the yellow Chevy? There was so much detail about this car that it seems almost impossible that they can't find it. You know, maybe it was painted a different color, but remember, this is a pretty small island when you think about it. The driver's neighbors should have known the car or their friends or family. So it's just really weird that this car was never found. But what other people have pointed out is that it is a little bit odd that witnesses could describe the car in this amount of detail, but that they weren't able to notice the license plate or, you know, see what direction the car came from or went. Again, no witnesses from the 7-Eleven saw a car that looked like that there the day Ji Zhao disappeared, and no one ever saw a man that day that looked like the man that was driving the yellow Chevy. But Ji Zhao's abduction and this man really don't have to be involved. You know, maybe there is no connection between this yellow Chevy, and a lot of people are focusing on the human trafficking theory. You know, did someone maybe notice that all of these children were out selling tickets and they were by themselves and specifically preyed on Ji Zhao for that reason? Or was this just random? To me and to a lot of people, it seems like whoever took Ji Zhao used the tickets as a ruse. You know, maybe she had approached them and asked them, do you want to buy some tickets? And this person saw that a young 12-year-old little girl was all by herself, so they decided to take advantage of that. They could have told her, 
yeah, I'll buy some tickets, but I don't have my money with me. It's at my house. Why don't you come with me and I'll give it to you there. They could have used that as a way to get her inside their car or to get her inside their house and to also just get her out of the public eye. But, you know, her mother had told her to not go into anyone's car or to not go into anyone's house. So maybe this was someone that she knew, maybe like a neighbor or someone in the community that she had seen before. And that's why she felt comfortable enough going in their car. Now, I honestly think this is why I don't think schools should make students do this anymore. I feel like if they want kids to sell candy or like sell tickets, they should have them only go with their parents. You know, the fact that before they were sent to just go knock door to door all alone is so scary and frightening. You never know whose door these children could be knocking on. It could be a predator's door. So I personally truly believe that's what happened to Ji Zhao. You know, someone took advantage of the fact that she was alone selling these tickets and they took her. The police have described this case as very rare because kidnapping by strangers does not happen very often in Hawaii. In most cases, they know who has the children. So Ji Zhao's case continues to baffle them to this day. She would have been 48 years old today, which is absolutely insane. Another question is the composite sketch of this man. I mean, so many years have passed and this man has still not been identified or found, which is very confusing. I mean, how does no one in this island know who this man could possibly be and how have police just never found him? Now, in 2018, when Diaz was asked whether he thinks Ji Zhao is still alive, he responded with, quote, well, I'm among the group of people who believe that she met with foul play. Now, that being said, I would pray that I'm wrong, that nothing happened to her and somehow, somewhere, she's alive. And somewhere, somehow, she will come forward if she is alive. Now, he still thinks about this case to this day and he wonders, you know, did I do enough? You know, did we as the police do enough? And he says that he felt at the time of the incident that he did do his best to try and locate Ji Zhao. If someone does know something about what happened to Ji Zhao, Hopefully, after all these years, they've changed their perspective on it and they will finally come forward with the truth. In 2000, Ji Zhao's family got their American citizenship. On the occasion, Ji Zhao's mom, Yan, said that, quote, Nothing is going to take the place of her daughter, but I think getting her citizenship makes her a little happier. She really wanted to come to this country and she wants to stay here and become a citizen. She says that there was no freedom in China. Here, at least, she is free. In 2018, Yan released a statement saying that, quote, she extends her heartfelt appreciation to the news media, HPD, the AG's office, and all other organizations which have so tirelessly assisted on this tragedy. Although it has been 30 years, she still thinks of Ji Zhao every single day and still hopes for information leading to her recovery. You know, the fact that the family had moved to Hawaii in hopes of finding a better life and this terrible thing happened to them is so heartbreaking. Ji Zhao was only 12 years old and she just deserved so much more. It's so upsetting how so many years have passed by without any closure for the family. I just can't believe that she disappeared in 1988 and now we're in 2023 and her family still has no idea what happened to her. I know so many years have passed since Ji Zhao was last seen. You know, at this point, the family just wants closure. So if you do happen to know anything about the case, please contact the Honolulu Police Department Missing Persons Unit at 529-3115. Or you can also call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-843-5678. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. I will definitely keep you guys posted on the investigation. I mean, hopefully this case does get solved one day and the family can finally have answers and closure. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to Ji Zhao Li. If you're watching this video on YouTube, make sure to leave me a comment down below so I can see your thoughts on this case. And if there's ever any other cases you would like me to cover, also leave me a comment under my YouTube video or send me a message on Instagram. But yeah, that's pretty much everything I have for today's case. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my channel true crime jackie on youtube for full video episodes you can also find me on tiktok and instagram at true crime jackie bye guys